All right, Jaws is coming around for another pass. Mr. Hooper, get the line ready. I gotta make good on this review. Hurry it up now, tie it on. He's coming straight for us. Hooper, if you screw this up, content ID will be all over us. Don't wait for me. Here he comes. Now! Shoot! This is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth film reviews in less than five minutes. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. The mother of all shark movies, Jaws, celebrates its 40th anniversary this month. So to celebrate, we'll be reviewing three shark-related films, beginning with Jaws itself. When this horror thriller from young director Steven Spielberg premiered in June of 1975, crowds were literally lining up around the block to be among the first to see it. And hence the term and business strategy of blockbuster was born. The $9 million production would eventually gross $470 million, making it the highest grossing film in history, at least until Star Wars came along a couple years later. Loosely based on Peter Benchley's novel of the same name, the PG-rated story follows Roy Scheider as the newly appointed police chief of a fictional island town who must deal with a massive shark terrorizing its citizens. Despite the obvious dangers, he's pressured to keep the beaches open by Murray Hamilton, the stubborn mayor, more concerned with tourism than safety. Later, the expertise of crazed local fisherman Robert Shaw and high-strung marine scientist Richard Dreyfus are called in to assist with the growing threat. This core trio blend together splendidly, carrying entire scenes with their antagonistic chemistry and camaraderie. Their performances are what really sell the implausible premise, including a haunting monologue by Shaw about the terrifying sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Although the focus is largely on them, there's a large supporting cast that deliver great moments of their own, from Lorraine Gary as the steadfast policeman's wife, to Lee Ferrero as an angry, grieving mother of one of the victims. Although the first 73 minutes of the two-hour film take place on the island, it's the final act set on the open waters of the Atlantic Ocean where the real meat of the story is. Chronicling the adventures of man against beast, it's an awesomely fun, prolonged, but well-paced payoff to the first half of the film. They harpoon the 25-foot great white with large yellow barrels to help track its movements, but are positively shocked when the monster manages to submerge with three of them still attached. Nicknamed Bruce after Spielberg's lawyer, the deadly fish was brought to life with a combination of waterlogged animatronics, puppetry, and real-life footage of actual sharks. But the techniques used gave the crew so many problems, Spielberg was forced to cut the shark's on-screen appearances down drastically, which serendipitously gave Jaws its famous less is more approach, borrowing inspiration from earlier Hitchcock works. Instead of seeing the terror early, the victims are photographed beneath the waves from the ominous point of view of the shark itself. In fact, Dreyfus once said of the notoriously troubled production, we started the film without a script, without a cast, and without a shark. When Bruce finally makes his grand appearance, the quick cutback to Scheider might be my all-time favorite reaction shot. Quickly realizing they're in over their head, the chief then advises, you're gonna need a bigger boat. Filmed on location in and around Martha's Vineyard, Spielberg fills the wide anamorphic frame, one of the few times he's filmed in that format, with bright colors and deep focus backgrounds. Long takes carefully utilize the movements of the actors to adjust the focus of the shot without ever cutting. An unbroken conversation on a moving barge is particularly impressive, as its dynamic background and careful blocking keep the two-minute scene interesting. This meticulous yet patient style has been a trademark of Spielberg's work ever since. But it's not the expertly done cinematography that gives this picture its personality, but instead the little moments of charm and serendipity sprinkled throughout. Like when the guys compare battle scars, or when Scheider holds Dreyfus's glasses in his mouth, or the faint glimmer of a shooting star as the men prepare for battle. Of course, you can't talk about Jaws without mentioning its Academy Award winning score. The now iconic themes from legendary composer John Williams are brilliant in their simplicity, utilizing everything from strings, woodwinds, and even a xylophone to make their mark. But it's the oft-repeated leitmotif of the shark itself, alternating between quickening tuba notes that really deliver chills. It mixes wonderfully with the impeccable sound mix and tight editing, which also won Oscars as well. The high-concept film spawned three sequels, theme park attractions, a dozen video games, merchandise, countless imitators, an annual week of programming on the Discovery Channel, and even a musical. 
The grandfather of all summer blockbusters that redefined beach culture for an entire generation, it has remained timelessly enjoyable for 40 years. Spectacularly crafted, seamlessly acted, and endlessly exciting, Jaws is a magnificent and riveting adventure for all ages. And here are six of your reviews. An obvious classic, everyone loved this film. In fact, not a single person rated it lower than an 8. We both agree Jaws is an amazing movie. For tonight's poll question, what's your favorite Man vs. Beast film? Leave your response as a comment below. Next up tonight, one of its many imitators, Deep Blue Sea. Released in late July of 1999, this Rennie Harlan production made over $100 million in profit atop its $60 million budget. Mixing elements of science fiction, horror, and action, this is a totally preposterous yet simultaneously entertaining 105-minute adventure. Leading a team of scientists on an isolated research facility, Saffron Bureau searches for a cure to Alzheimer's by experimenting on a trio of super-intelligent sharks, who predictably break free and begin eating everyone. A rather unlikable character and hardly a recognizable name herself, the casting of Burroughs in the lead role is certainly a curious one. She's able to handle the rigid technobabble and aquatic stunts surprisingly well, though. Attempting to bait the giant fish, she taunts, she may be the smartest animal on the planet, but she's still just an animal. By endangering the lives of her colleagues, she ostensibly becomes the film's only real antagonist, but inherently I'm inclined to agree with her aggressive research methods. A cure for Alzheimer's absolutely would be worth the lives of a few marine scientists. Trapped on the sinking facility with her is Thomas Jane as a resourceful shark trainer, LL Cool J as a religious chef, Stellan Starsgard as, who else, a scientist, Michael Rappaport as a happy-go-lucky assistant, and Samuel L. Jackson as a headstrong CEO touring the lab. And in a truly bizarre move, prolific bad guy actor Ronnie Cox has a brief non-speaking and uncredited cameo for no reason whatsoever. This eclectic group aren't the best fit for each other, but in a movie like this we're more concerned with how they'll die instead of how they'll interact. And on that point, mostly all receive fantastic and graphic demises, thanks to their hungry adversaries. The shark's constant presence looms over every scene, giving the film great and necessary consequences. This culminates with an absolutely fantastic jump scare moment that punctuates one character's dramatic monologue. Seeing a 20-foot shark glide through a flooded hallway, for example, is positively terrifying. The rising water is just as much of a threat as the fish, though, with several scenes, especially a sequence inside a burning elevator shaft, feeling very similar to the Poseidon adventure. On a related note, the set design is a real highlight, giving the characters unique locations to explore while being framed by detailed close-ups and colorful wide shots. Although the R-rated picture takes a while to really get going, it occasionally plays against the expectations of its formula, tricking the audience to expect the predictable before delivering something new. For the late 90s, the computer-generated creatures are handled impressively well, and the movie remains quite suspenseful and well-paced throughout. But it's also rife with giant plot holes. Like, why is there only a skeleton crew present the day of their biggest scientific breakthrough? And if the sharks are so smart, why do they bother flooding the building and eating humans when Jane is quick to point out all they want is freedom? A scene with a tall and sexy burrow strips down to her underwear to avoid electrocution also seems particularly gratuitous. Pulling a Will Smith, Cool J lends his talents to the film's titular pop song, which boasts the unforgettably ridiculous lyric, Deepest, bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin. The primary score itself by Trevor Rabin borrows themes from Jaws and Psycho, but is an effective original work in its own right. A guilty pleasure I've enjoyed many times since its release. In fact, it was one of the first DVDs I ever bought. This movie is undeniably fun. Sure, the premise is absurd, the acting rather stilted, and the effects don't always hold up, but it's easily the second best shark movie ever made. Deep Blue Sea, unbelievable and stupid, but truly exciting entertainment. And here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. Although you like Sam Jackson and the interesting premise, you faulted the film for its effects and overall absurdity, scoring it a 5. 
My pension for dumb carnage allowed me to overlook this picture's biggest flaws. I know it probably doesn't deserve such high marks, but I've always loved this movie. I think it's great. Finally tonight, Sharknado. This made-for-TV horror science fiction disaster film premiered on the Sci-Fi Channel in summer of 2013 to a massive response on social media. The patently insane 85-minute plot was rather obviously born backwards out of the film's titular pitch line. A tornado infested with sharks wreaks havoc on Los Angeles. Fortunately, Beverly Hills 90210 alumni Ian Zuring used to be a surfer, so he knows a thing or two about killing giant flying fish. Despite his washed-up D-list status, Zeering is about the only person in the cast with even an ounce of talent. He's still pretty awful here, and only took the job because his wife convinced him they needed the money, but he's the lone bright spot in the otherwise dreary cast. Attempting to survive this implausible terror with him is Tara Reid as a perpetually frightened and confused ex-wife, John Hurt as a fat and lazy drunk, and Casey Skirbo as a flirtatious bartender. The rest of the cast is populated with disposable meatbags who suffer various gruesome deaths whenever the TV-14 Reddit story calls for more blood. One character even makes a poorly timed period joke when he quips, looks like it's that time of the month, moments after another victim was eaten live right in front of him. There's no consistency with any of the events. The danger and water levels rise and fall depending on the needs of the individual scene, with continuity a distant afterthought. Sharknado was reportedly shot in just 18 days, and it certainly looks like it. The cinematography and overall visual style here is downright pathetic. Keeping characters in focus is about the only thing it gets right. Besides being bland, unsaturated, and generally boring, shots of sunny Los Angeles are poorly color corrected to make it seem like there's a large storm overhead. In an effort to avoid costly effects, a majority of the film just takes place inside various automobiles, an unfortunate trademark of all productions made by the Asylum. When special effects are required, they look decidedly fake and pasted on, like some intern just hardly rotoscoped a Muppet onto a live-action shot. The editing isn't much better either, a constant mess of close-ups constantly cutting around creatures and backgrounds too expensive to frame properly. When the cinematic appears, Ferris wheel breaks loose and begins rolling uncontrollably towards a fleeing crowd, the result is comical rather than exciting or suspenseful. The generic royalty-free sounding theme music doesn't help matters either. A climactic slow-motion shot where Zeering slices a flying shark in half from the inside out using a chainsaw is pretty dope, however. Capitalizing on the film's unexplained popularity, Sci-Fi attempted to retroactively convince the world that the film was meant to be satirical. But I remain unconvinced. This looks and feels like a failure on all fronts. But its success somehow led to two follow-ups, which besides having a bigger host of cameos and better effects, were at least more self-aware of their absurdity. This inaugural installment, however, is devoid of entertainment or rewatchability. As a film, Sharknado is indescribably ridiculous and awful, and as an experience, it's unintentionally hilarious. An achievement of stupid nonsense. And here's what you had to say about it. Even if you accept this film was stupid on purpose, it was still hard to watch. You rated it a bad. While I realize I gave Deep Blue Sea a pass for many of the same faults I'm criticizing here, I can't in good conscience give this film anything better than my lowest score of garbage. That said, I'd still recommend watching it, especially if you live tweet its premiere screening with the rest of the world. Finally tonight, a look at some of your tweet critiques. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Next week, we'll be reviewing three more releases from spring 2015. Entourage, Spy, and Jurassic World. If you get a chance to see these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. And if you'd like to watch more Movie Night videos, check out the related reviews on the right, or click subscribe if you'd like to see more of this show in the future. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.